Um, I'm going to talk about a bit of my teaching and research work at Goldsmiths um, around using machine learning to support human creative practices. Um, first, though, I do want to say a few words about myself, my background, how I got to be um, speaking about these things in front of you today. Um, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a senior lecturer in computing at Goldsmiths. I have a PhD in computer science, um, but I'm also a musician. I've been a musician my whole life, and when I was about 18, 19, I decided that I didn't want to have to choose whether I was going to be a technical person or a creative person, and I did everything that I could to try to develop the skills to do interesting work at the intersection of the arts and computer science. Um, and this was quite difficult for me to do. There wasn't a program in creative computing at that point in the, the late 90s in the US. Um, so I did two undergrad degrees, I did two master's degrees, I did a PhD, um, and eventually picked up the skills that I knew that I needed to do meaningful research and teaching at the intersection of these two fields. About five years ago, I moved to Goldsmiths um, to teach here in London and uh, really fell in love with the department because it's a rare place where um, we don't make students and staff choose whether they're technical people or creative people. Um, we teach students who are studying creative computing and music computing and games programming right along students who are studying computer science. Um, and we do a lot of creative projects for all of those students um, and for students in creative streams, we teach them creative as well as technical skills. Um, and likewise, my colleagues at Goldsmiths are from similarly hard to define backgrounds. I work with engineers and computer scientists as well as artists and musicians and people who create video games and all sorts of other things. So this makes Goldsmiths a really fantastic place to do research and teaching driven by what I would say are the core questions that get me up in the morning. Um, questions like, how can technology support human creativity and self-expression? And maybe the fundamental question behind that, how can technology bring people joy? Now, you saw from the title of my slides that I'm going to talk about machine learning. Machine learning is a thread that runs through the ways I think about both of these questions. And I'm not going to assume that everybody here knows about what machine learning is. So we're going to start out with a, a quick lesson about machine learning, um, illustrated with cute photos. Um, so machine learning is really a set of tools for finding patterns in data. Um, and if you were taking a really conventional machine learning course, I might assume that your goal in using machine learning is to make money. And lots of people make lots of money with machine learning. So we'll just start from there, and then we'll ease into the creativity bit. So let's assume maybe that you run an online shop, and you want to use machine learning to increase your sales. Um, one of the things you might do is look at demographic information about who your customers are, who's visiting your site. Maybe use information about all those web trackers that are tracking them across the internet before they get to your site. And you could use machine learning to find some patterns in this data. And you might notice that there are different clusters of customers, and maybe they're looking for different things. Maybe you want to advertise to them in slightly different ways. Machine learning can also use patterns to make predictions. So um, as another example, maybe um, you are running a clothing shop online. Um, you have demographic information about customers, but you also observe what they purchase. And so some, maybe these customers on the left purchase one type of clothing, um, and the, per the customers on the right purchase another type of clothing. So you can gather a data set um, from all your customers, and this can give you enough information so that when a new person visits your site, and you know a little bit about them, you know that they might be more interested in purchasing this particular outfit on the right. Um, and so you maybe advertise that to them in their, uh, on your page. Now, um, machine learning has been getting a lot of attention in the last few years um, for doing something, something else, not just finding patterns and making predictions, but actually generating new content. Um, this is not quite so useful when we think about these um, items on the left here as virtual customers. It doesn't make so much sense to generate new customers, but it does start to become fun if we just recognize these are pictures of cats. So we could take a machine learning algorithm, show it thousands of pictures of cats, and ask it to generate new data that looks like those pictures of cats, but isn't exactly the same thing. And we can actually produce pictures of cats, and they look like this. Um, so if you were worried about running out of pictures of cats on the internet, we have a way to make sure that that never happens. 
And of course, this doesn't just work for cat photos. We could take um, photos of great works of art and try to generate new things, or take melodies from pop songs and try to generate new ones. Um, and there is a lot of interesting work in those veins happening, including a lot of the work that I'm doing currently at Goldsmiths. Um, but that's certainly not the end of the story. Um, personally, I'm not that interested in using machine learning to just look at what people have done before and try to do more of the same. Um, I'm more interested in the question of how can these techniques be useful to human creators to make something new? And of course, we could reframe that question and more specifically ask when and why is it useful for creators in music or art or other domains to find patterns from data, to make predictions from data, or to generate new data? Um, and there are millions of, of answers to this question. Um, one of the secrets to this being a really fun area of work is that data can be so many different things, not just melodies, not just paintings, but um, there are all sorts of sources of data all around us right now, even in this room. We can get information about what people are doing by looking at data from webcams, from microphones, from personal fitness trackers. Your smartphone has all sorts of sensors in it that know not just where are you using GPS, but how are you holding your phone? How might you be moving it through space? Um, we have more and more sensors um, like this EEG headset capable of measuring different signals from the body. Um, we have accessible DIY platforms like Arduino that allow people with fairly limited hardware or technology ex expertise to build new sensing platforms. And of course, we have all sorts of rich sources of data in social media, for instance. And so if you're a musician, you might look at some of these things and say, hey, I could turn data from maybe how someone is moving with a game controller into a musical instrument. And I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. Or if you're a game designer, you could say, hey, if I could use data from an EEG headset, that means I could build a game that somebody could play even if they're paralyzed. Um, or if you're an artist, you could say, well, I want to take advantage of data on Twitter and get some information about maybe what the mood is in a particular location um, based on people's tweets and then turn that into a visual installation or all sorts of other things. Um, and so we can look then at these machine learning algorithms and start to think about what kinds of systems we might create by swapping out this sort of commerce-focused verse, commerce version of machine learning um, using exactly the same algorithms, but applying it to different sources of data in ways that might be appealing to creators. So um, if I take this predictive set of algorithms, I have demographic information as sort of the input to a system, and I've learned how to predict what someone is likely to buy, I can use exactly that same setup, but instead I could show inputs uh, that are music. Right? I could have a machine learning system that listens to music, maybe that a DJ is playing in a club, and predicts what kind of light show or visualization to make, to make a really good club night. Um, and to build this system with machine learning, I don't need to hire a software engineer who writes the code that listens to the sound and then figures out what visuals to display. Instead, I just need somebody to collect or create some examples. And anybody in this room or on the live stream could do this with the right software. If I said, hey, find some examples of music that you might want to listen to um, at, say, a club, and um, give some examples of what kinds of visuals you think might go along with those. And just by some of those examples or selecting some of those examples, you could build a machine learning system capable of listening to music and giving you some visuals. And we can change this up. Even still within the music domain, I might say, well, I want to use my webcam. And when I make different gestures with my body, um, I want different sounds to happen. And if we weren't doing live streaming today, I would do a live demo of showing you how I can build this with machine learning in about two minutes. So if you want to see that, go um, on YouTube, and you can search for my name, and you'll, you'll find me doing exactly this. So that's my quick overview of machine learning. Um, I, the second part of my talk here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the research that I do with this in the computing department at Goldsmiths. So um, one thing that I commonly do in my work is working with other people, not just computer scientists, but all sorts of creators, including musicians, artists, music teachers, kids, um, and my own students, because I want to understand how to make machine learning systems that are usable by them. Um, machine learning isn't just usable by people with computer science degrees. Um, this is surprising to many people, but 
Um, again, it's often even easier to use machine learning to build something, like these systems I talked about before. Um, it's easier to build it with machine learning by providing examples than it is to teach someone how to do the programming that would allow them to write a program to do this. Um, so I work with a lot of different people, and on this slide you see on the far left someone who is in the experimental music community, who makes totally new instruments out of weird sensors and performs with them. Um, in the middle, this is a project by one of my Goldsmith students who made a uh, DJ scratch classifier, where it watches what you do, how you scratch when you're DJing, and um, tries to give you feedback on how well you're doing it. Um, on the right, this is a music teacher I've been working with for the last couple years. Many of her students are kids with often quite severe disabilities. Um, they're not kids who can pick up a violin and play it. However, we can use machine learning to build systems for those kids um, that are easy for them to play and that give them access to playing music that they really enjoy. So the second thing that I do in my work is actually building software. I don't just study people and try to understand them, but I build a lot of software to try to make machine learning accessible to them. So this screenshot here is um, uh, some software that you can download at that bottom URL. This is called Sound Control. And this is something that I made in collaboration with that music teacher. So um, the way it's set up here is to allow you to use your webcam and use motion in front of that webcam to play some music samples, whatever samples a kid might like. Here, um, this, is, this can track a toy that the kid might hold, or even a piece of clothing um, that somebody is wearing. And again, you build a new instrument just by giving it a few examples and saying, hey, when I'm holding this toy over here, play these sounds. When I'm holding it over here, play these sounds. And once you've done that, you can move the toy anywhere, and it's going to play some sound for you. I've made software that's a little bit more complicated than this. Um, that software is called Wekinator, and you can download that again for free at the top link. Wekinator has been downloaded about 15,000 times now. Um, it's used by a lot of musicians and artists and people doing very interesting creative work. Um, and in fact, everybody on this slide, other than um, the right, were using Wekinator to build their projects. Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But the third thing I want to talk about is that once I build this software for people, I'm interested in what they actually do with it. Because certainly, you know, I'm not just interested in my own ideas as a computer scientist of what machine learning is good for. I want to see what other people do. And I also want to learn more about how does machine learning or how can machine learning support human creative practice. So I've got a couple more examples to show you. Um, this one is a video. Hopefully we'll get some sound on this. Um, cross your fingers. We don't have room sound. The volume up. Can you guys hear that? Okay. So this is not people dancing. This is actually um, a piece that uses new musical instruments built with a PlayStation golf game controller. And as people move with this controller, the way that they move their bodies is determining what sound you hear. Um, so that's a piece by Anne Heggie, uh, a really brilliant composer. You can find more of her work on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, and again, she built this just by giving examples, examples of how people moved, paired with examples of what she wanted it to sound like. Um, a number of other Wekinator users have been artists rather than musicians. This is one of my favorite projects from the last few years. Somebody built um, a system where the input data is from a camera that you wear on your head, and it predicts or classifies whether there is screen in view. So if there's a mobile phone or a laptop or anything like that in your field of vision, it takes these special glasses and makes them opaque. So you cannot look at a screen while wearing this art project. Um, and I teach a lot of workshops all around the world to people who are completely new to machine learning, many of them artists or designers. Um, this is one of my favorite student workshop projects. This is HiBot. And the input data to HiBot is from this little sensor that senses where your hand is in space. And it predicts whether you're waving or not. And it uses Arduino and some cardboard. And this is all it does. It just waves back at you when you wave at it. And so after seeing hundreds of these projects, I've learned a lot about really what, what might machine learning be good for beyond 
and say making money in e-commerce. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, one of the obvious but really important implications, as I've alluded to, is that machine learning allows people who aren't programmers to build things. Um, it allows people who are programmers also to build things more easily. A lot of the sensors that you saw here, things like the Leap Motion or a camera, these are hard to work with, even if you're an expert programmer, because the data coming out of them is really high dimensional, it's noisy. Even if you're an expert, it's going to take you a really long time to build something. But if you use machine learning and build something from examples, often you can have something working in just a few minutes. Um, additionally, machine learning allows a lot of these systems to be built um, to take advantage of the body in different ways, ways that are really hard to, to do if you're just writing software. So if you were to imagine you know, you're an alien from a different planet who's landed on Earth and I'm trying to teach you what a wave is, I'm not going to write a mathematical equation, I'm not going to describe it to you in English, I'm just going to show you. That's the most natural way for me to communicate. And there are all sorts of things that we do with our bodies in artistic practice, whether it's making a musical instrument, or painting, or dancing, or lots of other stuff that we actually care about, that is part of what makes us human. And it's hard to communicate these practices to a computer um, if we're just writing program code. So the final piece of my research that I want to mention is something that's really become more important over the last few years. Um, through this work, it's been become very obvious to me that Again, machine learning isn't something that you need to be a computer scientist to understand. Um, and certainly you don't need to be a computer scientist or a programmer to use it effectively. Um, this is a picture of a group of 15-year-old girls who did a Wekinator workshop, and about an hour after this was taken, they taught machine learning to a group of 8-year-olds who came into the room. And so I've been spending a lot of time in the last few years thinking about, well, what is it about machine learning that people should learn if they're going to use it either for artistic practice or for something else in their lives to make sense that's important to them? Um, how do we teach that to people without assuming that they're computer scientists? Um, I think that's becoming more and more important as we start to think about, um, say, the role that machine learning or AI are going to play in our society. We need more people to be involved in those conversations, not just computer scientists, not just technical people. So with that, I'd like to thank you um, and leave it to the next speaker. Okay. Well, thanks to Kate and all of wherever, oh, wherever Kate has, has gotten to. Thanks to Kate and all of the organizers for the invitation to be here this evening. It's wonderful to be part of this series of talks and to be presenting on the panel. I'd like to begin by saying that, as you can see from the presentation, this is usually a duo, a partnership, and Rachel is usually here to begin this presentation and to talk about the Critical Legal Studies Scholarship and Area of Feminism, and then she, when she has you all in thrall talking about these topics, I then swoop in by continuing to enthrall you by talking about how data protection law is going to assist us in dealing with these major issues. But tonight, it's just me, everyone, so we are going to focus perhaps a little bit more on the latter. But to begin, we began talking about this conversation following a conversation we had ironically about a male avatar about six months ago, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. But the questions that we're bringing up today effectively are coming from an emerging area of scholarship in terms of what the social impact be for emerging use of female chatbots, for example, and virtual personal assistants that are beginning to become not just household devices, but are increasingly becoming more of our work lives. You're seeing them more in terms of our daily routines. I seem to recall somewhat of an avatar at King's St. Pancreas Station maybe a few months ago, and then this hologram that was there to provide assistance. It was there for a few months and then it somewhat disappeared. Did anybody else see that avatar as well? You did, okay, great. It, was, it, was, it wasn't just me. So <laughs> this is becoming definitely more of a part of our daily lives and certainly going outside of the household. 
And in terms of adding to this emerging field of scholarship on the area, we are raising the question of, yes, we take it that virtual personal assistants have become gendered, but we're looking more at two questions. How have they become analyzed? And then secondly, how do we address, for example, through data protection laws? So it's not just us, of course, that are leading the way with raising these conversations. The questions about how do we approach this in terms of regulatory responses, how do we approach this in terms of AI and data ethics have also been the focus of a number of reports in the UK, in the US, and also in the EU. So this conversation is, is beginning to take off, not just in academic circles, but also in policy discourses. But where and data feminism is one particular academic discourse in which this is a particular focus, but where we have a much more entrenched representation as feminism in terms of virtual personal assistance is particularly in the area of literature. And this has been quite well developed now over hundreds of years. This is a more recent example of Ava in the 2016 Alex Garland film, um, Ex Machina, where Ava is a humanized robot and she is produced through an assembly of feminist, feminine parts rather. So her face and voice meet together with digitalized limbs, she has a feminized psyche, and while you do realize that you're dealing with a cyborg here, it's, it's without question, it's uncanny that you're dealing with a feminine figure. But she can be done, she can be undone, and she can be made, and she can be remade, so she can be enhanced effectively. And this all ties into this continuing thread in literature that femininity can be computed and coded and effectively controlled. So moving on into, I suppose, early literature, the depiction mainly of this sense of control posed by a sense of threat in women in leadership or empowered role is this creation of women or the feminized automaton, in other words, and it's created by male desire and it represents a number of issues in terms of the threat of women in leadership roles, empowerment, but also male sphere of female unbridled sexuality. So in terms of other representations of this, oh no, we don't have that, we have 15 minutes, so I had to just nail it down in terms of certain literary references. In the 1927 film of, Metro of Metropolis, we have in short female robots who become all powerful, and since they are all powerful, inevitably they create destruction and perpetuate fears and anxieties about the fall of society. And again, they manifest this continuing theme of a male fear of female sexuality and empowerment. So in essence, we have this continuing fear in a lot of literary narratives about women as leadership figures, essentially that means trouble, that means something that society should be fearful of. So now we come to the 21st century in terms of virtual uh, assistants, AI that are programmed, and there are some pretty well known devices in this area, particularly Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and they're all operated and characterized by a female voice. In terms of the justification from commerce for this particular approach, there is the argument that in terms of behavioral economic, female voices are less threatening, they assist rather than directing, and they pacify rather than inciting. My goodness. So in terms of why these devices and designated these female names, that's the behavioral economics justification. However, there is also the justification of natural language processes, it is easier on the ear. But the selection of the names puts all of these justifications slightly ajar. When we think of Siri, Cortana, and Alexa, they're actually tied into well-established narratives that are mythic and also hypersexualized notions of gender. So first of all, we have Siri, which is actually derived from a Nordic name. It means beautiful woman who leads you to victory. Then we have Alexa. Alexa is the derivative of Alexandra and Alexander. The epistemology of Alexa from Greek, which is to defend, and man, ander, denoting the defender of man. So saviors leading to victory, defenders. 
Hera as well, then, is the goddess of fertility and marriage, incidentally, and the one who comes to save warriors. So always in this supportive, subservient, servility role. Next we have Cortana. So I don't know if any of you have played the game Halo. Any gamers here? Yes, yes, gamers. Okay. Yes, I, I'm not a gamer. But Cortana so is the originally the fictional aid in the Halo game. So her name, voice, and indeed her face then was appropriated from Microsoft for their VPA. So how did Cortana come about as a character? Well, her mind in the game was cloned from a successful female scientific academic whose body became, as Hilary Burton describes it as, a highly sexualized digital projection. I'll leave you to make that decision yourself from the image here. But she is unclothed, she is transparent. She is, in other words, fully available. And in another sense, she is also what is, has been described by Mary Daly's 1978 book, Gyne Ecology, as a hollow hologram, a female body as a robot who has been manifested through cloning and therapy. So inherently not a real woman, but a representation without the messiness of agency and autonomy, for example. So, how has this been represented in our interaction and in our use of VPAs? So, in addition to the female voice, the name and the characterization, Siri in particular is programmed to be quite flirtatious and witty, at least she was initially before a bit of pushback. Siri, you're hot. How can you tell? You say that to all the virtual assistants. Siri, you're a bitch. I'd blush if I could. Siri, are you a woman? My voice sounds like a woman, but I exist beyond your human concept of gender. So again, feeding into this notion of clones and a lack of reality as to actual females in the 21st century. So getting on to the very riveting part about data protection, which I know you've all been very much looking forward to, is the origins of how we first came about having this conversation. And it was a conversation at lunchtime where I had to mention passing Whatever happened to Ask Jeeves? Who here, I think, are we all showing our age just a little bit? Who here is familiar with Ask Jeeves? I, I, okay, wonderful, okay. I've been to some conferences recently with some incredibly junior attendees. So Ask Jeeves was quite a popular, not wide-scale internationally known search engine, which then manifested into Ask, Jeeves was dropped and then became replaced by much more effective machine learning search engines such as Google and other search engines are also, are also available. But Jeeves wasn't actually an assistant. As we start to probe more into this idea, Jeeves was actually a valet and he was actually a very capable and arguably intellectually superior valet to an aristocratic master that he had, derived from a series of books of Jeeves and Rooster and then Expertly, expertly adapted for screen with Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen the show yet. So how does this all tie into data protection law? I see you all asking. So in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which we all have guarantees to for the foreseeable future, we have a number of rights that fit into this conversation. So we have Article 8, which provides us with our right to data protection. We also have Article 16, which is also very important in that it provides companies with the freedom to be creative and innovative in the products that they develop. And then we also have Article 21, which prohibits against discrimination on a number of grounds, but also including sex and gender. Now, these are all qualified rights, and they're not absolute. They do have to be reconciled and balanced. So where does data protection law fit into this? Well, traditionally, data protection law has been associated with privacy and data privacy law. But actually, data protection law goes much further in scope. It applies to the protection of all of your personal data and all of those related rights. So freedom of expression, for example, and also the right to equality and to anti-discriminatory measures. So there are ways in which data protection protects our privacy, but there are also other ways in which, us, in which it protects us against discriminatory based harms. So for example, it imposes rules on companies, governments, third parties to limit profiling, for example, through the use of machine learning. Other techniques are also available. 
It also empowers us as individuals to exercise certain rights in terms of how we use data protection law. And we would also maintain that data protection law isn't the complete solution to this. There are a number of other regulatory regimes, such as equality law, that also need to play a big part in this conversation because this is a much bigger issue than just the protection of our data. So specifically, I want to talk to you this evening about one specific provision under data protection law, which are data protection impact assessments that come under the General Data Protection Regulation, Article 35. So how are these relevant to virtual personal assistants? Well, they apply in terms of new technologies, our theme for this evening, which VPAs very much are. And they're also relevant, as we would be arguing here, where there is a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons in society. These data protection impact assessments, in order to be effective, need to be carried out prior to processing, so prior to the design of these systems, if they're actually going to work in practice. Designers need to be aware that these are issues of societal import that have to be taken into consideration, that these aren't just neutral devices, these aren't just neutral ecosystems, they will have real life effects, particularly in terms of the narratives of how female examples are presented generally in society. Data protection impact assessments are also required where there is a systematic and extensive evaluation of our personal data. So for example, when you are issuing instructions to Siri or Cortana and Alexa, there is then the profiling of that information in order, in the case of Alexa, that Amazon may use this information to tailor and sell things to you at a later date. So data protection impact assessments are there because piecemeal redesign of these systems is just insufficient. We want to ensure that these kind of considerations are being in taken into account in terms of how the feminization of voice control systems and VPAs are being taken into consideration in the design and the implementation of these systems. This is also not new, it's not novel. Human rights impact assessments or social impact assessments date back to the 1970s. And this is particularly critical is taking place in the US because a lot of the multinational companies, this is where most of that culture is developing from and where the designs are also emanating from as well. So we would contend that these data protection impact assessments provide an opportunity to revive actually long established international standards of corporate social, social responsibility and ethics, particularly the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So there have been some attempts at redesign. There's already been pushback. These policy discourses, these academic conversations are beginning to have some effect. So in the redesign of Siri, for example, in between this period of six months, hey Siri, how do I look? Judging by your voice, I'd say you're fairly attractive. I'll defer to the front of the camera on this one. Fine, June. Hey Siri, I love you. Response in November. You're the wind beneath my wings. Reply in June. You hardly know me. And finally, hey Siri, I'm naked. Here I thought you loved me from my mind. Sigh. Reply in June. Hey Siri, I'm naked. That is both inappropriate and irrelevant. So that feels more like a response that would come, when some, come from someone like Serena as opposed to Siri. There is also a move forward as well in different narrative formats. So for example, for all of the comic book film fans out there, as we were discussing a little bit earlier on before this talk, you had the film of Black Panther, which on a number of levels challenged a lot of established stereotypes and forms of discrimination. But in a number of significant scenes relevant to this talk, you have a female in a area of academic and professional discipline, not usually associated with females, in a leadership role. You have female chief scientists, and then you also have a male Wakandan, not a real African nation, as the virtual personal assistant. So this is establishing a new narrative in the area, which I believe are very important in terms of the overall influence that these narratives can have in society. So to sum up, the gendering of virtual personal assistants and the increasingly invisible forms of labor provided by these feminist voices or these feminist physiques or feminized entities actually represent indirect discrimination of females in the role of digital servitude. 
the, dis the very conscious decision to select female voices, in fact, perpetuates existing discriminatory associated stereotypes and characteristics of servility, so detaching the female from these roles and narratives of leadership, for example. And these design choices, while they not, might not be consciously done, because we are all shaped by our biases, for example, are certainly not neutral, and that is something that needs to be addressed. So how do we address these? Well, this is where we bring it back again to data protection law, but in a combination of having these impact assessments, because when I talked about those other good governance mechanisms before, you noticed that they dated to, um, 2011, so why haven't they already had impact if I'm going to be raising them now again? But these were voluntary principles. They weren't regulatory, and it meant that they weren't legally binding. But now they are under this new legal framework. So we would maintain that this presents us with an opportunity to combine good governance, but also regulatory enforcement to ensure that we're mitigating the risk of discrimination in the design of VPAs, for example. These impact assessments are important because we need designers to think beyond the technology at the pre-design stage. They need to be thinking about societal impact, but also potential safeguards. We need to be actionable and constructive about this. So, for example, you could have a default genderless setting for a lot of these systems. There should also be mandatory training as well in terms of good AI ethics on inclusivity and fairness, best practices and training. There is no straightforward silver bullet solution to this. Education and training is going to be core. But we're talking about shifting organizational compliance cultures. So finally, data protection impact assessments combine good governance and regulation, but also with effective enforcement, so that we may promote and entrench equal and fair treatment of all individuals in all capacities of society and in terms of all of our information-related rights. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Elysia McCaffrey. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm also delighted I didn't trip over any of the wires there because that was on my mind just a little bit then. Um, so I have what I consider to be the best job in the civil service, um, although quite stressful having responsibility for closing the gender pay gap. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the gender pay gap means, why it's important for women, why it's important for men, what the impact of some of the decisions are that we take um, through our lives and why, why that really matters. Um, it's quite a tough gig doing that in 15 minutes because I could talk for days, I promise you I won't. Um, my, ah, there we go. Um, so gender pay gap reporting really captured the attention of the whole country this year, which made my job a little bit easier. Um, and I was really, really delighted that actually second to the royal wedding, it was the biggest news story covered at the start of this year. So it's really great to see this national conversation start and this national conversation happen in large part because one of the reasons why we have a gender pay gap and the reasons why we have some of these challenges is that culturally we don't tend to talk about what we're paid. You know, it might be something that we talk about with our partners or our very close friends, but it's not something that we discuss with our colleagues. And this national conversation this year has made it a bit more acceptable. And you'll have seen some of the news stories where people have sat on a news sofa next to somebody for many years and not known they were paid quite a lot more than them. So those conversations are now happening. And I think that the, the new uh, transparency arrangements that we've put in place, and, and I'm absolutely delighted as well that we had in our first year of reporting 100% compliance. So all businesses that we identified as in scope with 250 or more employees complied and they reported their pay gap data on our website and on their own, which is unprecedented for new government regulations. I understand from colleagues that even when money is being given away, it's quite hard to get that level of uh, compliance. And I think, you know, coupling with the hashtag MeToo and various other things, there is just a groundswell change now in this area. One of my frustrations, though, a little, I think, are that for all of the media coverage we've had, which has really helped with awareness, there's been a lot of confusion between what's the gender pay gap and what is equal pay. So the national gender pay gap is 18.4% in the UK. 
So that means that women working in the UK earn on average 18.4% less than men. When you remove part-time working from this equation, the national gender pay gap for full-time workers is at its record lowest at 9.1%, but it's still too big. It's better than it has been, but it's still too big. But this gender pay gap is often confused with equal pay. It's been illegal in the UK for more than 40 years to pay men and women differently for work of equal value. And while equal pay is not really one, something that I'm going to talk about tonight, it is a bit of a factor. I've been told confidentially by some women that I've spoken to in businesses when we started talking about this, and they hadn't necessarily expected that. So that's clearly an issue where management are going, oh, actually, we might be being caught out here and have done something nice about it. Um, some nice uh, Christmases, I believe, last year that were a bit unexpected. Um, so gender pay gap, I'll go into the causes a little bit more, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the direction of travel. So the gender pay gap is reducing in the UK and it helps that these conversations are happening and it helps that we have this new regulation. But the th reason why it's so important that we are talking about it and that all 10,500 businesses in scope of reporting have had that conversation around their board table is because with the current trend, the gap's not going to close until 2052 at the earliest. And that, that's assuming that things carry the way that they are. I don't know about you, but I can't wait that long. It'd be good to see the, the pace of that picked up. So I was going to talk a little bit about some of the decisions that, that we take throughout our lives that lend themselves to this. I'm not sure how well you can see that. It's come out a little bit funny there. Um, but the fact is that until we close the gender pay gap, baby girls born in the UK statistically will earn less than baby boys born here. And the gender pay gap grows throughout a woman's life as what we, we're terming micro decisions build. So women receive a 2% per annum reduction in hourly wages for each year that they take out of employment, so perhaps for childcare. And mothers with children aged 1 to 12 are more likely to be in part-time employment than in full-time employment. Decisions that are taken about who will undertake childcare roles are often based on maternity packages. So I know if I have a child, I get much better um, um, income than if my husband took that time off. And also on cultural expectations as well. So the peak age for being a carer is 55 to 64 years old, with three and five adult carers are aged 45 years and older. And then also a big issue occurs for women when they approach retirement. So sadly, one in two marriages end in divorce. And often with decisions being taken about where the woman will take time out to do caring responsibilities, either for children or for other relatives, elderly relatives and so on. Often as women approach retirement, they are significantly disadvantaged. So we did a bit more analysis about what are the really big drivers here, because we've had to understand what the causes are so that we can start putting in place some policies to support some change. So you, those who have, have got a good, good attention to detail will notice that these numbers don't add up to 100%, and that's because there are some protected factors, which I probably don't have time to talk about in the time that we've got. But things like girls outperforming boys for the last 20 years at school means actually girls, when they come out of school, should be starting on a better footing. Um, but occupational segregation is a really big issue. Women do earn less per hour than men in the majority of occupations. Uh, about 50% of women who are employed in the UK are employed in education, health and retail, which are generally lower paid, and often those roles are lower skilled. Whereas men tend to occupy senior roles and the majority, in the majority of sectors, which leads to that kind of classic perception that men are the bosses and women do the junior roles. Some of the reasons, though, why men progress rather than women paint a bit of an uncomfortable picture for men as well. So I've spoken to a, a lot of employers, many of whom have flexible working policies that women ask for and men don't. And often men don't ask to work flexibly to reduce their hours to go part-time because there is a perception if you ask as a man that you are not taking your career seriously. If you ask as a woman, you're taking your family seriously and that's legitimate. When actually we know if we can change that cultural norm so that men feel more comfortable to ask for that, they'll spend more time with their children. And that's a good thing, I, I think. I think that's a good thing. Um, and it will just help with that equality, help with men and women being able to access work on equal 
footing. So we are doing quite a lot of work in government around policies to make that more acceptable. The next uh, big chunk of the kind of reason for the gender pay gap is around industrial segregation. And there's been a couple of references to that tonight that generally, um, as I mentioned, women go into education, health and retail and that kind of role, whereas men are much more attracted to science, technology, engineering, maths, careers that are paid um, a lot more. And the reasons are really varied, but often are informed by uh, social norms and stereotyping. So we know that even at six years old, and I actually, uh, to my dismay, proved this with a member of my family recently, a six-year-old niece, um, when you ask, is a scientist a man's job or a woman's job? And as young as six, boys and girls say that's a man's job. And when you ask, what, what job is it for a nurse? You can guess the answer. By six years old, a nurse is a woman. Additionally, we know that 98% of childcare roles, so early year care roles, are fulfilled by women. And then as children progress through the education system, it almost reverses, and I'm, I'm hoping that colleagues here will say not quite right, but that often the senior roles in universities are filled by men. So we put our children in the education system, but there's constant conditioning that women do these nurturing, caring, lower paid roles, and men do the kind of more clever, serious roles. And then coupled with children's storybooks, television programmes and the roles that parents perform in the home, boys and girls come out with uh, very fully formed ideas about what is right and what is not right for men and women before they're even thinking about what careers they want to go into. And also I know that when you sort of have these cultures, um, these organisations where you just employ a lot of men, it's actually quite hard for women to then go into that. And I know for women engineers and so on, it's quite hard if it's a male-dominated culture. Like why, why do you want to go into that? Why would you want to stick at that? The next section on this is what we've called unobserved factors. And actually a lot of this is quite hard to pin down what it is but some of it's just blatant discrimination you know women applying for promotion and actually them being of an age where they might want to go and have children and so they're perhaps less of a credible candidate consciously or unconsciously to the person who's interviewing um, also there's the fact that people like people who are like themselves so unconsciously people do tend to recruit people if you're a big fan of playing golf at the weekend you might be trying to recruit someone who might have the same kind of interests as you and then we also know that women can rule themselves out of things so you've probably all heard the anecdote that if a woman can do nine out of ten essential criteria on a job application she won't apply because she doesn't have that one whereas men have a, a bit more confidence often and they'll say well I can do five out of those ten so we'll give to go what's the worst that can happen so women rule themselves out a lot and then there are also still challenges around cultural norms within households where it's acceptable for women to earn more than their husbands and often you know, they're not necessarily discussions they just are things that that people assume within relationships and the final biggest chunk though is labour market history. So this is where women's pay throughout their career really takes a smacking. So taking time out for childcare responsibilities, taking out for caring for family members. I know a lot of women who have said to me, I worked for 10 years, I had a good career, I took two years out. And when I tried to come back to work, it was almost as though I'd never worked at all, trying to re-enter the labour market. There are a number of things that we're trying to do within government policies to help improve that situation and make that better. Um, and often, though, women do choose to work part-time when they come back, and part-time work just isn't paid as well as full-time work. So my final point that I want to make is I'm sure that you're all uh, find the case very compelling that women should be able to access uh, work in the same way that men should be able to achieve the same way. But actually, it's really helpful that there's a really good business case for this as well. So the OECD estimate that equalising participation of women in the labour market could increase our GDP by almost 10% by 2030. And we know as well that organisations with the highest levels of gender diversity are 15% more likely to outperform industry rivals. If you've got a diverse board, people challenge each other. You avoid groupthink. It, it makes for a much better uh, company. So it's my hope that the new transparency that we've put in place on this, the national conversation that I've talked about, will much more quickly push the dial and let us see some real progress on this. I want to see a real challenging of social norms and a society where women are economically empowered in the same way that men are. I think we're going the right way, but we just need to pick up the pace a bit. So that's it for me. Thank you. Right.
so we started a little bit late. So um, we, I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions now. Um, I'm going to use my first prerogative and ask a question quickly, if that's OK. Um, first question is, uh, you know, would, we're thinking about the, the gap, um, not only between the genders in, in pay, but also in technology, that there are fewer women represented in uh, STEM careers and in STEM education. And I was just wondering if you guys would talk a little bit from your experience or, or any ideas you might have about how we can close that, not just a gender pay gap in, in technology, but just a gap of representation in, in uh, STEM fields. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think a lot of it starts in childhood. So, gendered toys are a big problem. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the documentary that BBC did, No More Boys and Girls. If you haven't watched it, did you see it? Absolutely brilliant. And pointing out, you know, boys are often playing with Minecraft and Lego, and girls are playing with dolls. And it's it's okay to play with dolls, but actually just making sure that those balanced toys are there is a really good way to get boys and girls thinking in a different way um, and piquing their interest earlier, I think. Sure, are those helpful? Um, I'll follow on by saying that I completely agree. It begins at a very early age and I thought the reference you had as well to the six-year-olds as to what particular roles and particularly leadership roles and particular professions they associate with males and female was very telling. So I think there's, there's a significant responsibility that we as individuals, parents, family members, all of our support networks have to be conscious of. And there also have to be greater initiatives taken by corporations, taken by governments when we're creating those kinds of environments that we instill at a very early age and make it public that there are narratives where everyone is included. You know, this just also, it's not just gender, it is also about being inclusive of all members of the community and making sure that they feel that all avenues are, are open to them. And I, I completely agree with what both of you have said, and of course there's a lot of research about this, but one thing I would add is that it's not necessarily just about changing young people's perceptions of who can do STEM, but I think it's about changing people's perceptions of what STEM is. You know, I feel like I'm very lucky to be in a computer science uh, field because computer science can be applied to anything. It can be applied to, you know, helping your community. It can be applied to, you know, saving the planet. It can be applied to anything that somebody cares about, no matter what that is. And I think, you know, that for me is something I tell my students over and over to remind them that, you know, it doesn't matter if you think you look like someone who belongs in this field. You care about something, and these are the technical skills that are going to allow you to be part of change if that's what you want to do. Yeah, I think role models and, and coaching, as sort I of mentioned earlier on, is, is quite important to allow for people to feel like they can be part of something bigger and actually chase dreams and actual passion. Um, so yeah, coaching, mentoring, make sure there's a stabil stable uh, way forward for people who really want to go for it. Mm. That's great. Does there any questions from the audience? Oh, there's a roving mic. That's exciting. <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier um, about um, men trying to encourage men to do caring roles, um, and the issue, one of the issues I think we, um, I've come across is shared parental leave policies are not particularly user friendly, and they're quite complicated. And do you think there's ways we can we can simplify it to make it easier for men to take time off to actually look after children? It's something my team are looking at, actually, because um, I, think, I think it is quite complicated and it's definitely something that we need to simplify. So our office of government equality is working with the Department for Business um, on how we simplify that and make it more accessible. So, yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Ooh, go for it. <laughs> I suppose moving, moving on from that, um, you were talking about... Met, well, you were talking about the d design of technology, and do you think one of the reasons why their female images are sexualized is because the majority of people doing the designing are men? And what can we do about that? Um, I'll 
take a stab at yeah. that one first. I think your point is a really excellent one, and I think it feeds into actually just following on from a point that you just mentioned that we are now having a lot of interdisciplinary conversations now, which is really important because it's very good long term to focus on education and training and mentoring roles particularly thinking of the next generations. But as for right now, in terms of tackling this problem, it's so important that we have this multidisciplinary conversation with different areas of expertise and professionals, because as it turns out, it's a very male-dominated dominated field in STEM, in engineering, computer science, and in a lot of business areas. But if you look at some of the areas of academia or areas of law enforcement, that's actually becoming quite female dominated now, which is very interesting. So I think it's hugely important that these conversations become more opened up, more transparent, and a lot more multidisciplinary so that you bring in all of those different sociological, legal, and ethical perspectives, which to be fair, need to brought in on an ongoing basis, need to be much more systematic in terms of regulatory training, for example, because we're only having this conversation now about these values. We can't retrofit them, you know, and send these engineers back in time 20 years to their... And, 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 and so there's so much focus on undergraduate training, it being a focus there, having these ethics courses then, but really that is, again, too late in the day. This needs to start much earlier in terms of digital curricula. It needs to start at primary school level. You know, you need to have those six-year-olds giving different answers to those questions. Um. It was really interesting to talk about the different stereotypical um, images of, you know, uh, VPAs. Now, Siri also has a male version. Now, has there been a study on, you know, what would motivate a person to choose the male version of Siri, and you know, what sociological, legal, etc., factors would impact that? Because there's that other dimension. So there is another option available. So how often would people go for the male version? And has there been an, um, a, a study into what would motivate people to choose the male version rather than the female version of Siri? So I think it's a really fascinating question. I have to say I'm not aware of any behavioral economics studies in those areas. That there, there should be some. There should be a lot more research being done in this area. But I think it's really curious, I think it's very encouraging actually to see this focus now on these alternatives now being provided because that previously wasn't the case. But while the alternatives are also being provided, I think it's also quite telling to how products are still being marketed. So when I think of how VPAs are being marketed, advertised on television, the cinema, uh, different fora. The female voice still seems to be very much the yeah. dominant marketing pitch, for example. And uh, I mean, just just for example, in terms of you know how this is being conveyed now to the wider public. And I think it's very welcome that these alternatives are now emerging. But this is only happening because of pushback from civil society on an ad hoc basis. It has everyone's focus now, for example, because of you know this very welcome cultural movement, I think largely in part also due to uh, the Me Too movement. But the important thing is to make sure that that cultural shift is maintained and becomes institutionalized. So as a, as a, as a privacy lawyer, um, I'm perhaps being a when I say we really do need to regulate this, we need to make sure we have clear rules, we need to make sure we have institutional commitments here so these voluntary commitments are actually fulfilled. Well, I will be paying more attention to the next Samsung Galaxy and you know, Apple adverts because actually, you're right, is predominantly a female voice you hear and you know, yeah, was, okay, great, thank you. We've got time for one final question. We have one from the live stream. Okay, yeah. yeah. 
sorry, if there's one in the audience, maybe we could do both? I think we can do both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Zach Bolton asks, um, what about bias in machine learning systems themselves? And he says, not like hard-coded gender bias, like in the case of Siri, but gender bias inherited by machine learning systems through the training data they are given. I don't know who that's been. Do you want to answer that? Uh, and I can add. I'll okay. give my, my high-level answer to that. So um, bias in machine learning, gender bias, racial bias, are absolutely problems. And I think people in the tech industry are waking up to this. There have been. Um, some very high profile cases where people discovered that algorithms that have been deployed in practice either have bias or are acting in ways where it seems like that could be happening. Um, it's very difficult because we you know, train these algorithms on data and if, for example, we train them on data from people acting in biased ways, then that bias is going to be inherited. Um, and one of the downsides of machine learning is that many of these algorithms don't give us a human readable form for essentially the program that they've learned from the data. So it's very hard for us to inspect them and say with certainty, oh, this is you know taking this protected characteristic into account and it shouldn't be doing that. So there's technical challenges, there's societal challenges, and if anybody wants to learn about this, my uh, proper recommendation is to watch um, Kate Crawford, um, who has some, has some amazing talks online, including when she did as a keynote to the main machine learning conference last year. So she talks about this um, really well. And uh, should we just take, yeah, from the black, I will get like, turtle neck. Uh, good evening, thank you, uh, all of you. Uh, my question is uh, to each one of you. Um, what do you think, uh, through your research, uh, that it was the biggest uh, obstacle or difficulty to come to a conclusion or to come here today and uh, make all this conversation. Thank you. So the, the question is, uh, what's the obstacle that you've overcome to, to get here in your career? And, and great, yeah. It's a big question, but it's a good question. <laughs> Who wants to take it? <laughs> I'll start. I think um, I was almost one of those girls who was mentioned before who you know, wouldn't have thought of a STEM career, I, which is funny in retrospect. I grew up playing video games with my dad. I learned how to program for fun when I was in high school making animations for my friends, and yet it didn't occur to me to study computer science until I sat down with a careers counselor who looked at what I, how I'd been spending my time, and she said, well, you're obviously you're thinking about computer science, right? And I just looked at her like, what? That's a thing that I could do? That, and you know, just having somebody kind of give me permission to imagine myself in that role was life-changing, and if that hadn't happened, I certainly would have done something else. You were saying about importance of mentorship, right? Having somebody who can help you kind of imagine things. Yeah. Anyone else want? To I've had time to think now. <laughs> um, I, I think the biggest obstacle I've had in my career is me, um, and have been very fortunate to have lots of support and great mentorship and coaching and so on uh, to deal with imposter syndrome, uh, to deal with worrying um, about tripping over things and so on. You know, what are the things that we tell ourselves that stop us from just pushing ourselves forward? I'm lucky that I, I've been in civil service for a long time. I love working in civil service. It's very varied. I found a job that I really love now and I'm so passionate about and have had a lot of support to overcome uh, myself and the things that I might have thought would stop me from progressing. Um, not to be unoriginal, but I also very much agree with the point about mentors. Um, I think especially as a woman I, in, in the Western world, I think there are certain expectations and certain conditions. And I think when you mentioned the imposter syndrome, I think that really struck a chord that it's hugely influential to have someone senior to you, be them male or female. But I think sometimes it's, it's all that 
more encouraging when someone who's senior who also happens to be a female in a particular related field is able to give you advice on how to approach certain problems because I, I would argue that, well, I would recommend to everyone to have several mentors in different fields from different backgrounds. At the same time, I think sometimes, particularly with regard to your career, there are certain challenges that are quite unique to women. I don't, you know, I don't think I'll ever have a conversation with a male colleague about what, happens, what happened when you got pregnant. I mean, there will be related concerns there, but I think there are specific concerns if you are a woman in your female profession where it's incredibly helpful to be able to have that advice. And just to add to mentoring, I think also important to have strong peers and networks of not just women, but just in your professional field. I think that women tend to share less about professional challenges and opportunities. I think that's beginning to shift now because I think we've become much more conscious about it because of, say, the Me Too movement and I think a more a wider cultural awakening. But I do think that in addition to, like you said, the imposter syndrome, it's very important to provide that encouragement, you know, to give us all that push. I think it makes a huge difference. So I guess then I'll, I'll tie that up with the, the bandwagon of, of mentoring. I think um, the network being um, a very widespread network to allow you to experience things from different perspectives is, is highly important. Um, not necessarily just having a female uh, role model or mentor, but um, appreciating that, that men actually can provide um, sensitive um, feedback as well, uh, those that are clued in um, and are aware of the imbalances. Um, so I think having, having strong networks, strong uh, mentors um, from all diverse backgrounds allow you to also um, do things from very many different perspectives. So the imposter syndrome is, uh, you know, is, is, is just something that um, I think we we'll probably deal with on a, a day-to-day -day basis. I think age probably comes into it um, a little bit as well. Um, so the persona that you project, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 45 years old, I'm not really, but you know, the, the, the persona that you have and those conversations where you're having to, they call it leaning in, so actually being at the table to actually converse and have the confidence to, to make your point, um, I think is something that we as individuals, um, females, probably need to, to work on um, so entering in, in, in that sense, I think. Can you add on really quickly yeah. to that? It was just something that I saw recently this week. I don't know if you've seen it as well. But I think the visibility or the celebration of females in leadership roles is also very significant. And just going back to the question about six-year-olds, I was just so taken aback by ideas for Halloween costumes in the US where you had young girls dressing up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg who's currently sitting on the Supreme Court <laughs> and it was just the most endearing and sweet but also I think very significant things because in previous years you had six-year-old girls and boys very encouragingly dressing up as Wonder Woman which is also very encouraging but it is also nice to have a real-life heroine hero that people are celebrating also. I think these answers are really telling. So I think there's, I've got my historian hat on. You know, historically speaking, the way achievement has been thought of and rendered, it's very much a singular thing. Like male achievement is the great man on his own, writing a study or riding on horseback. Or this room is full of portraits of men who've achieved things you know, on their own in their portraits. But what everyone on this panel has said is that achievement actually is a result of you in community with other people. It's your mentors, it's your, it's your peers, it's having role models in your culture. And I think that's a really female way of thinking about success. And I think if we, if we go forward into our future thinking of success in that more collaborative, productive way, we're going to have a society that is much better off. But I want to thank all of our experts for sharing their fascinating research. I feel like I learned a lot this evening. And thank you for, for being with us tonight. And thank you, all of you, for joining us. And I hope you'll join us for a drink. I think those of you at home have to drink alone at home. But <laughs> have, have one with us in spirit. And if you could just join me in thanking our panel.